Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? This week, we are going to jump right into the action because this is episode 119, part two, or B, if you will, 119B, and we're going to go into day two at Gettysburg. So we're just going to jump right into the action. Now, day two at Gettysburg, we'll see Lee deciding to continue the assault on the Union troops to keep up the advantage. Before we jump into that, though, I want to talk about the state of both armies. We will start with the Confederates first. Longstreet is going to finally arrive, minus his trailing division under Pickett. As mentioned, Lee is going to want to continue with the momentum and bring the fight to the Yankees. Remember, though, that Stuart and his cavalry have not yet arrived, so Lee is going to rely on intelligence gleaned from an engineer, Captain Samuel Johnston. Johnston is going to reconnoiter the Union positions, but he is going to do so in the dark. Now, Johnston is going to claim that he gets all the way to Little Round Top and that he did not see any Union troops. This would be hard to believe, considering if he goes by his most probable route, he would have run into Buford's cavalry. It is more likely that he did not actually get to Little Round Top and instead to another hill. Oddly enough, though, there would be an opportunity to roll up the Union line as we will soon see. But we are going to have problems. Some cite the fact that Longstreet wants to be more included in the battle plan as the reason for the delay in attack. If you recall, a while back we mentioned that Longstreet probably thought he would slide into Jackson's role. We know also that he is a capable offensive general, but in this particular instance, was looking for a more defensive action. Is he going to drag his feet a little bit? Sure. There are some good reasons for this, though. Troops are going to take the wrong road that would expose themselves to the enemy while getting into position, so they will have to backtrack, which takes time. Longstreet's Corps was also in need of some rest after a long march, so there were factors that could excuse old Pete. However, was he going to be energetic in carrying out Lee's plan of attack? Not particularly. Should just kind of talk about a little bit at least. Longstreet is under the false impression that Jackson was able to communicate in a different way with Lee. I think it was more so that they were on the same page not so much equals. Lee is still the commanding officer, so Longstreet probably was mistaken in that regard. But remember, too, he also really wants an independent command, so maybe that's going to factor into his decisions as well. We talked about it a couple episodes back when we first started setting up Gettysburg. Longstreet is going to allow, shall we say, an invasion of the North because he wants to fight an offensive-defensive battle, which means set up let the Union Army attack them, have a good position like Fredericksburg, and then they'll be good to go. So, obviously, Lee doesn't want to do that. He believes that some kind of divine providence has allowed for the Union Army to be here, and therefore, he's going to be able to strike a blow at them. Something that shouldn't really surprise us, because Lee is always going to be trying to attack or have some kind of offensive action in his battle plans. AP Hill was going to be lackluster as well so he does not get a good mark. Longstreet also does not like Hill, so there's a lack of cooperation between the two. Yule was going to want to remain where he was on the line, even though it might have made more sense to move to Seminary Ridge, so all Lee's immediate subordinates are having issues. As a small criticism of Lee, he also does not personally see the ground which his assault is going to take place, so he does share at least a little bit of the blame but we are still going to see something very close to success on day two. It is possible he was also under the impression that Pickett would be ready to attack with the rest of Longstreet's corps. Longstreet having the famous line to Hood that he does not like to go in with just one boot on, perhaps adding to the delay. On the Union side, we mentioned the army getting into position. The 5th Corps, after hard marching, would arrive and be in reserve. Dan Sickles and his 3rd Corps would get to the end of the Union line. 
Meade did not like Sickles, so maybe he wanted him farther away, but it's more likely Sickles had simply come up the Emmitsburg Pike and found himself in that spot. Remember, we talked about the Emmitsburg Pike kind of coming in from the southwest toward Gettysburg. Because of this, he would find himself on the southern end of the Cemetery Ridge Line, but there was a problem for Dan. He was not on high ground and would see higher ground in front of him that could be used by the rebels. Some historians have cited the Hazel Grove experience from Chancellorsville as his inspiration, but Sickles never admits to that. There is a post-war writing that defends the decision to move forward. This author, who is probably actually Sickles himself, titled Historicus, and he's going to write the following. Meanwhile, the enemy's columns were moving rapidly around to our left and rear. These facts were again reported to headquarters, but brought no response. Buford's cavalry had been massed on the left, covering that flank with outposts and vedettes, and were thrown forward on the Emmitsburg Road. While awaiting the expected orders, Sickles made good use of his time in leveling all the fences and stone walls so as to facilitate the movements of his troops and to favor the operations of the cavalry. What then was the surprise of Sickles to see all of a sudden the cavalry withdrawn, leaving his flank entirely exposed? He sent an earnest remonstrance to General Meade, whose reply was that he did not intend to withdraw the cavalry, and that a part of this division, Buford's, should be sent back. It never returned. Under these circumstances, Sickles threw forward three regiments of light troops as skirmishers and for outpost duty. The critical moment had now arrived. The enemy's movements indicated their purpose to seize the Round Top Hill. In this, in their possession, General Longstreet would have had easy work in cutting up our left wing. To prevent this disaster, Sickles waited no longer for orders from General Meade, but directed General Hobart Ward's brigade at Smith's Battery, 4th New York, to secure that vital position at the same time advancing his line of battle about 300 yards so as to hold the crest in his front, he extended his left to support Ward and covered the threat and rear of the army. The writing will go on further to try to justify the decision, but we should also note that Sickles does do much in terms of the preservation of the battlefield after the war, mostly because he is convinced he saves the Union Army on July 2nd, but you can be your own judge. Regardless, Sickles is going to have not enough men to cover the ground he intends to cover. The salient of the Union line will touch the Emmitsburg Road and then curve back past the Rose Farm and to Devil's Den. I'll make sure to post a map to the website for reference. In fairness to Sickles, Meade had placed emphasis on protecting the route to Emmitsburg, so this could have been fresh in the mindset of his subordinate. There's also much back and forth that occurs between himself and headquarters. Sickles given the okay to act within the parameters of Meade's instructions, which he actually doesn't do. The Third Corps is supposed to be connected with the Second on Cemetery Ridge and in the center of the line and have its left flank at Little Round Top, which it does not. After the fact, Sickles is going to say that Artillery Chief Henry Hunt gave him the okay to relocate, although Hunt's going to deny that. Further on Cemetery Ridge, veterans of the 2nd Corps would watch as the 3rd Corps moved out. While observing the splendid movement, they would understand a fight was about to happen. When Meade confronts Sickles, the political general would offer to withdraw, but Meade, pointing to the Confederates, will respond that those people were not going to let him. He is going to allow for Sickles to draw reinforcements from the 5th Corps and the Reserve Artillery. Some of the 2nd Corps would also be involved. One of the things I think that is lost in the narratives and in researching is how quickly these things happen, making it probably very confusing to piece things together, even if you were there. For most of the day, the armies are idle. The Confederate attack is supposed to move forward in the morning, but is delayed until the afternoon. Overall, it's only going to be about a few hours in length. The assault is going to be an attack in echelon, with various units having different jump-off points. Hood would lead, followed by McClaws of Longstreet's Corps, then followed by Anderson's division of Hill's Corps further north. With Sickles where he was, though, he's kind of in the way, so the Rebels are going to have to shuffle their plan a little bit. The goal will be the same. 
still roll up the line to the north. Hood is going to observe that he could move around the round tops to the south and get into the Union rear. This would be because Buford has vacated and gone back to Maryland, as we mentioned in the last episode. Longstreet is going to reply that they were going to have to follow General Lee's orders and not deviate from the attack. Now, I've seen some historians that will point that Longstreet's kind of being petty or he's just saying, ah, well, because my suggestions weren't taken into consideration, then obviously we're going to have to follow everything to the letter. But I've also seen a defense of Longstreet where he is kind of saying, hey, we, we can't go too far outside the realm of what Lee is asking us to do. And that's not necessarily rolling up the Union line, is it? It's getting into the rear. It probably would be good. And I've seen some places that have said it's probably not even feasible for that to happen, but it would have been very different of an attack than Lee wanted. So there's a little bit of a defense for Longstreet there. On the other side, though, Longstreet is not going to do a good job of taking charge once things start to get mixed up. With all the movement, Union skirmishers would actually see the rebels shifting as they advanced across open ground and into Plitzer's woods. Bird and sharpshooters were involved in seeing that the Confederates were ready for a fight. Prior to an assault, Confederate artillery would open up on the salient. There are some on both sides who write that the ferocity of this artillery duel would be greater than the bombardment on the third day, which is hard to believe. For 30 minutes, the attacks were preceded by rebel guns. Sickles would make his headquarters at the Trossel Farm, down a lane from the Joseph Scherfey Farm. The Scherfeys had a peach orchard that made them a good amount of money, and this orchard would be the focus of a Confederate attacks. Hood's division would begin their assaults on the southern portion of the line at approximately 4 or 4.30, so remember it's a little bit later in the day. They would move up on the Devil's Den position on the Union line occupied by Ward's Brigade of Bernie's division. The second U.S. sharpshooters would skirmish with the oncoming rebels, actually delaying them for a time. In addition, they will withdraw back toward a little round top, which would pull the rebels in that direction. Hood is going to be wounded by artillery fire, knocking him out of the action, so there was not a clear direction in the assault. Bookmark that, that extremely talented offensive commander Hood is going to be wounded in a critical moment for the Confederacy, because we're going to see that again at Chickamauga. Evander Law would take over command of the division. Law, I have seen argued, did not really take charge of the assault until later in the day, which would make sense. I have also seen argue that he simply goes in that direction he is receiving fire from and deliberately moves away from the design plan of attack. It's questionable as to whether Law even knows he's in command. Probably doesn't. Hood gets wounded. Nobody tells him. As the rebels, particularly the Texas Brigade, advanced, they would move in the direction of guns attached to Hobart Ward's brigade, the 4th New York Light, posted on a ridge line before a cropping of rocks that will be known as Devil's Den. Now Devil's Den was a destination before the battle because of the large rocks that sit there. It would see some fierce fighting in the afternoon on the 2nd, as opposed to the picnicking it had usually witnessed. Now Smith has 10-pound parent guns, which makes him a likely suspect of wounding Hood as the rebels advanced. Robertson's Texas Brigade, which includes the 3rd Arkansas, would attack Devil's Den. Law's Brigade would swing around toward the heights. Ty Ganderson and his Brigade of Georgians would advance toward Regis de Trobian's Brigade, along Rose Ridge. Some of these Michigan, Maine, New York, and Pennsylvania regiments would be on the edge of Rose's wheat field, which will be known as the wheat field after the battle. Ty Ganderson will be initially repulsed, and Anderson would be wounded in the action. His Georgians will rally, though, and push away the Union men back away from Stony Ridge and toward the Wheatfield Road, a gap forming in the Union line. Tilden and Schweitzer of the 5th Corps and other brigades from Barnes's division would engage them in this part of the field. We have a description of the Confederate attacks here. Every tree, rock, and stump that gave any protection from the rain of many balls that were poured down upon us from the crest above, was soon appropriated. John Griffith and myself preempted a moss-covered old boulder about the size of a 500-pound cotton bale. By this time, order and discipline were gone. Every fellow was his own general. 
Private soldiers give commands as loud as the officers. Nobody paid any attention to either. To add this confusion, our artillery on the hill to our rear was cutting its fuses too short. Their shells were bursting behind us, in the treetops, over our heads, and all around us. Nothing demoralizes troops quicker than to be fired into by their friends. I saw it occur twice during the war. The first time we ran, but at Gettysburg we couldn't. This mistake was soon corrected and the shells burst high on the mountain or went over it. Major Rogers, then in command of the 5th Texas Regiment, mounted an old log near my boulder and began a 4th of July speech. He was a little ahead of time, for that was about 6.30 on the evening of the 2nd. Of course, nobody was paying any attention to the oration as he appealed to the men to stand fast. He and Captain Cousins of the 4th Alabama were the only two men I saw standing. The balance of us had settled down behind rocks, logs, and trees. While the speech was going on, John Haggerty, one of Hood's couriers, then acting for General Law, dashed up the side of the mountain, saluted the Major, and said, General Law presents his compliments, and says hold this place at all hazards. The Major checked up, and glared down at Haggerty from his perch, and shouted, Compliments hell! Who wants any compliments in such a damn place as this? Go back and ask General Law if he expects me to hold the world in check with the 5th Texas Regiment. That gives us a good idea about the confusion of the attack. That's probably more towards a little round top past Devil's Den there. So not necessarily the action we just mentioned with Ty Anderson, but still, the sentiment is there. The 1st Texas and the 3rd Arkansas would become separated from the rest of the regiments of the brigade. Fighting on Houck's Ridge would inflict roughly 50% casualties on the 20th Indiana as they squared off against the 3rd Arkansas. The 3rd would also engage the 17th Maine in this portion of the fighting. Colonel August Van Horn Ellis, commanding the 124th New York, would lead his men in a spoiling charge to plug gaps in the Union line. Famously, he would be mounted during the battle, making him a conspicuous target, and he would inform his fellow officers that his men must see him today. His 124th New York were known as the Orange Blossoms, and they would have an account of their part in the action. Now the enemy has been brought to a stand, but he's only a few rods away. Again, Cromwell walks toward Ellis. This time he is accompanied by Adjutant Ramsdale. Once more, he requests the colonel to charge, and is again told to go back to the left of the regiment. Yet a moment later, their horses are brought up, and they mount. The major's only reply is, the men must see us today, and he rides slowly too, and wheels his horse about to the rear of the center of the left wing, where with drawn sword and eyes fixed on the colonel, he impatiently awaits his superior's pleasure. Presently, Ellis, by a simple nod, gives the desired permission, at which Cromwell waves his sword twice above his head, makes a lunge forward, shouts the charge, and putting spurs to his horse, dashes forward through the lines. The men cease firing for a minute, and with ready bayonets, rush after him. Ellis sits still in his saddle, and looks on, as if in proud admiration of both his loved major and gallant sons of orange, until the regiment is fairly underway, and then rushes with them into the thickest of the fray. The conflict at this point defies description. Roaring cannon, crashing riflery, screeching shots, bursting shells, hissing bullets, cheers, shouts, shrieks, and groans were the notes of the song of death which greeted the grim reaper, as with mighty sweeps he's leveled down the richest field of scarlet human grain ever garnered on this continent. The enemy's line, unable to withstand our fierce onset, broke and fled, and Cromwell, his noble face flushed with victory, and his extended right arm waving his flashing saber, uttered a shout of triumph. But it had barely escaped his lips, when the second line of the foe poured into us a terrible fire, which seemed in an instant to bring down a full quarter of our number. Once more we hear our beloved Cromwell's shout, and once again we see, amid the fire and smoke, his noble form and flashing blade, but the next instant his brave heart is pierced by a rebel bullet. His right arm drops powerless, his lifeless body falls backward from his saddle, and loud above the din of battle we hear Alice shout, My God, my God, men, your major's down, save him, save him. Again, the onset of Orange County's sons become irresistible, and the second line of the foe wavers and falls back. But another solid line takes its place, whose fresh fire falls with frightful effect on our now skeleton ranks. So terrible it is that two-thirds of the artillerymen in our rear are either killed or wounded, and the balance driven from their guns by the shells and bullets which pass over and through our line. The account will go on, and uh, actually, August Van Horn Ellis is also killed during the fighting and laid next to Cromwell. Now the 124th would conduct their charge off Hawks Ridge into what is known as the Triangular Field, attacking the 1st Texas. The 4th New York and the 6th New Jersey would also do good service here, eventually facing down Rock Benning's Brigade of Georgians. 
Spinning was not supposed to be in that particular location, but found himself in a good spot to break the enemy line. Heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting would expel the Union defenders from this position. Smith would beg for the infantry to help him save the guns, which they do, although not all are able to get to safety. Just to rewind a little, McClaws was forced to backtrack because there were Union signalmen on Little Round Top. McClaws is going to grow frustrated with the lack of intelligence and the lack of attention his superior or Longstreet shows, which he is never going to forgive. G.K. Warren would realize the importance of the higher ground, and he's going to write so after the battle. The motion revealed to me the glistening of gun barrels and bayonets of the enemy's line of battle, already formed and far outflanking the position of any of our troops, so that the line of his advance from his right to low round top was unopposed. I have been particularly in telling this, as the discovery was intensely thrilling to my feelings, and almost appalling. I immediately sent a written dispatch to General Meade to send a division, at least to me, and General Meade directed the 5th Army Corps to take position there. The battle was already beginning to rage at the Peach Orchard, and before a single man reached Round Top, the whole line of the enemy moved on us in splendid array, shouting in the most confident tones. While I was still all alone with the signal officer, the musket balls began to fly around us, and he was about to fold up his flags and withdraw, but remained at my request, and kept waving them in defiance. Warren is going to find the nearest available troops, which are going to be part of the 5th Corps. Now, right off the bat, I want to point out that the usual narrative is that Warren is able to save the Union Army, and while there is something to be said for the troops that come up to Little Round Top and their bravery, it should also be pointed out that these men are being taken away from supporting the center, which almost breaks. Regardless, Strong Vincent is going to answer the call. Vincent's brigade is part of James Barnes's division. Barnes is reportedly drunk, which frees up Vincent's regiments to assemble on the height. In the meantime, the 5th U.S. Artillery under Charles Hazlitt is going to be placing their guns. That little round top is not conducive to cannon, the spine being narrow, and Hazlitt's guns are not going to be useful to counter the attacking rebels, but they are going to continue firing to boost morale. Vincent will deploy his brigade with the 16th Michigan, 44th New York, 83rd Pennsylvania, and the 20th Maine. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain will command the 20th on the left flank. Something I think we always picture is that these guys are on the hill watching as the Confederates slowly advance, but really, this is a race against time. They will begin to engage the rebels, who will use the rocky terrain and cover, as we mentioned in one of our quotes. Sharpshooters will use rocks and devil's den to fire on the higher ground. Now in Laws' brigade, we have the 15th Alabama commanded by William Oates. Oates and his men will actually advance first up Big Round Top, but that position is really even less strategic than Little Round Top, so they're going to be ordered off. Oates will write about the attack on the 20th Maine. We drove the Federals from their strong defensive position. Five times they rallied and charged us, twice coming so near that some of my men had to use the bayonet, but vain was their effort. It was our time now to deal death and destruction to a gallant foe, and the account was speedily settled with a large balance in our favor. But this state of things was not long to continue. The long blue lines of Federal infantry were coming down on my right and closing in on my rear, while some dismounted cavalry were closing the only avenue escaped on my left and had driven in my skirmishers. I sent my sergeant major with a message to Colonel Bowles of the 4th Alabama to come to my relief. He returned and reported the enemy to be between us and the 4th Alabama and swarming up the mountainside. But this time, the 15th Alabama had infantry to the right of them, dismounted cavalry to the left of them, infantry in front of them, and infantry in the rear. With a withering and deadly fire pouring in upon us from every direction, it seemed that the entire command was doomed to destruction. While one man was shot in the face, his right or left-hand comrade was shot in the side or back. Some were struck simultaneously with two or three balls from different directions. Captains Hill and Park suggested I should order a retreat, but this seemed impracticable. My dead and wounded were then greater in number than those still on duty. Of 644 men and 42 officers, I'd lost 343 men and 19 officers. The dead literally covered the ground. The blood stood in puddles on the rocks. The ground was soaked with the blood of as brave men as ever fell on the red field of battle. I still hope for reinforcements. It seemed impossible to retreat. I therefore replied to my captains, Return to your companies, and we will sell out as dearly as possible. Hill made no reply, but Park smiled pleasantly, gave me the military salute, and replied, All right, sir. Oates is going to go on to talk about the charge of the 20th Maine, the famous charge, 
And Oates is going to need to pin his account after the war because Chamberlain is going to exaggerate how he saves the Union Army on the day. Did Chamberlain have to refuse his line? Yes. Was it Chamberlain's idea? Possibly not. Did he lead a bayonet charge when the ammunition ran out? Yes, and it was successful. If Oates had broken Chamberlain, could the Confederates have taken the hill? Probably not. I've seen it pointed out in certain sources that one regiment that, as we have seen from Oates' account, has been badly depleted and exhausted now, would not have been able to turn the tide of the battle in this sector by themselves. And as you can see, they're not getting any reinforcements. Was Little Round Top the key to the Union position? And does Chamberlain save the Federal Army? Probably not. Strong Vincent deserves a lot of praise, and unfortunately Vincent will fall mortally wounded. The 16th Michigan will begin to collapse due to pressure. Fortunately for the Yankees, Patrick O'Rourke, who graduated number one in the 1861 West Point class, will lead the 140th New York to Little Round Top at this exact moment. He will be hit in the neck and killed almost instantly. Stephen Weed, his brigade commander, who had recently been an artillery officer, would also fall, as would Hazlitt, who is kneeling to hear the dying words of Weed. I have seen various arguments that all of these guys deserve a little more praise than Chamberlain. Unfortunately, they will all fall, and Chamberlain will become a hero. Like most of us, he's going to relish in that role. Overall, though, as mentioned, Warren is really just taking away troops that could have been better utilized in the center. Also, the Confederates are completely uncoordinated by this point. Law and Robertson have their men mixed up, so they probably don't pack as much punch as otherwise they would. These are some thoughts we need to keep in mind. The moral of the story is that the Union line holds, and the Confederates have spent their energies attacking in a direction they really didn't want to go. So we have the first stages of the attack played out. Hood's division has gone to the south. Now we need to update what's going on with Lafayette McClaws' division as it sits on the far side of the Emmitsburg Road. Remember that the Peach Orchards is a salient in the Union line. Political General Graham has his men in the orchard, but there is going to be a little gap between him and Detrobriand, as they are on the edge of the wheat field and Stony Ridge, around the Rose Farm. Joseph Kershaw is going to attempt to exploit this gap with his South Carolina Brigade. Artillery at the Peach Orchard had already been dealing death to Ty Anderson, and now it would be Kershaw's turn. We have a good account of this attack. The Yankees were ready and replied with spirit, and in less time than it takes to tell, our ears were deafened by the noise of the guns and exploding shells. A little to the right, I saw General Longstreet and staff dismounted behind the stone fence, watching the effects of our shots through their field glasses. I don't know how long this awful cannonade lasted, probably 20 minutes. But as it began to slacken, we were ordered to scale the stone fence behind which we were standing. This was quickly done, and then we were on the Emmitsburg Pike. On the other side of the pike was another stone fence to cross, and this done, there was no other important obstacle between us and the enemy. The cannonade suddenly ceased, and then we would hear Hood's small arms fire on the right and terrible crashes and roars. Our line formed in a perfect order of battle, faced a little to the left, so as to sweep the federal batteries near the Peach Orchard. Just before the order forward march was given, I saw General Kershaw and staff immediately in our rear dismounted. About halfway from our start at the pike to the federal batteries was a little downgrade to a small depression. We went along in perfect order, the 13th South Carolina being on our right. As yet, we could see no Federal infantry because it was covered by the wood in our rear of the batteries. We saw plainly that these artillerists were loading their guns to meet our assault. While their mounted officers were dashing wildly from gun to gun, apparently to be sure that all was ready. Just before reaching the depression already mentioned, a Confederate battery on the pike, somewhat to our left, opened fire. I heard one of our men say, that will help us out, believing, as we did, that its fire was against the Federal guns in our front. But alas, the next moment we saw its fire was directed at a point further to the left in the Peach Orchard. Well, just as our left struck the depression in the ground, every Federal cannon let fly at us with grape. Oh, the awful deathly surging sounds of those little black balls as they flew by us, through us, between our legs, and over us. Many, of course, were struck down, including Captain Pulliam, who was instantly killed. Then the order was given to double quick, and we were mad, and a full determined to take and silence those batteries at once. We had gone on to the level land of the Federal guns when the next fuselade of great met us. We were now so close to the Federal gunners that they seemed bewildered and were apparently trying to get their guns to the rear. But just then, and ah to me, to think of it makes my blood curdle even now, nearly 50 years afterward, the insane order was given to right flank. 
Of course, no one ever knew who gave the order or any reason why it was given. General Kershaw denied being responsible for it, but somebody must have been. Why, in a few moments, the whole brigade was jumbled up in a space less than a regiment behind a rocky, heavily wooded bluff with the right flank in the air, close to that historic scarecrow, the Devil's Den, and also the Round Top, quite near, with our left flank disconnected and wholly unsupported for a mile or more. We are truly in a box, liable to be captured or annihilated at any moment. Now, Kershaw did think that Barksdale and his Mississippi regiment were going to move with him, but Barksdale's held back. The order for the regiments to suddenly veer away from the artillery in Sherfy's Peach Orchard was blamed on the second's Colonel Kennedy, but it is never confirmed. The artillery would inflict heavy casualties, the South Carolinians heading into the woods of Stony Ridge. There are remnants of Anderson and his Georgians in and around this area. In the Wheatfield, we will have the arrival of John Caldwell of the Second Corps. His men will wish to stop the Confederate momentum. He has brigades under Edward Cross, Samuel Zook, Patrick Kelly, and John Brooke. Cross would advance his men into the wheat field and engage the enemy. During this action, Cross will be killed, an event that he had premonitions about before the combat. It's actually questionable. Cross might not necessarily have had premonitions of death, but he certainly was considering resigning because he had been passed over for uh, promotion to become a general. So it's questionable as to whether he actually thought this will be my last battle. That's the quote that he gives. Whether that actually meant this is my last battle because uh, I'm going to sort of buy the farm or this is my last battle because after it, um, I'm going to get out of the army. So it's questionable as to what exactly he meant. Patrick Kelly will lead the Irish Brigade into the Stony Ridge area where they will see some hand-to-hand fighting in the rocks and trees. Zook is mortally wounded as he leads his men in support of the two lead brigades. Brooke, likewise, will be wounded in the fighting, but his men will push the rebels all the way back to the far side of the wheat field. Schweitzer will initially resist being commanded by Caldwell to enter the fight, but Barnes will get his brigade on the move, and they will also advance across the field. To Caldwell, though, it would seem that everything was going well. His men had pushed back the gray and butternut enemy out of the wheat field. He's not going to believe it when he is told his men are retreating. But why are they retreating? They are doing so because William Wofford's Georgia Brigade has jumped off and sent them reeling. Now, Wofford was not supposed to be in the wheat field, but by this time the Peach Orchard line was no longer there. So he changed his advance so that he could actually be engaged with the enemy. We're going to talk about what's happening at the Peach Orchard here shortly. We have an account of Wofford's attack. This is actually going to also be from the same account from the attack from the South Carolina Brigade. When Wofford ordered us to join the right and rush forward, a tremendous rebel yell went up from our powder-choked throats. Wofford took off his hat and, waving it at us, turned back and charged along his line to the left. And here was seen how the right sort of officer can inspire his men to accomplish, next to superhuman results. Always Wofford rode right along with his men during a fight, continuously furnishing examples and cheering them with such words as, Charge them, boys. Those who saw it said they never saw such a fine military display as Wofford's line of battle as it advanced from the pike. He went right for those federal cannon that were firing at us. Nor did it take him long to reach those batteries and smash them even before the gunners had time to turn their guns upon him. Rushing over the artillery, he kept right and tackled the Union infantry in the woods beyond, and his assault was so sudden and quickly executed that the federal lines of infantry were smashed and gave way at every point in Wofford's way and as the remnant of Kershaw's brigade combined with Wofford's splendid body of men rushed along through the woods, and all the Federal supports met the same fate of their first line. It became a regular rout, and while the panic-stricken enemy fell by the scores and hundreds, Wofford lost only a few men. Sims and his brigade will also come up to stop the counterattacking Yankees. Somewhere around the Rose Farm, Sims, the brother of the successful Confederate naval officer, will be mortally wounded. Schweitzer's brigade will suffer heavy casualties as he is hit in the rear by enemy fire, briefly making a stand before collapsing. Famously, there will be a quote where, I believe it's Schweitzer is talking to one of his subordinates, and the subordinate says, well, I'll be damned if we're not facing the wrong direction. And that just kind of gives us an idea of just the confusing nature of this fighting. At this point, the Union Army had turned to Roman Ayers. Ayers already had his 3rd Brigade under Weed diverted. His two were remaining under Hannibal Day 
and Cindy Burbank are both full of regulars. The regulars will unfortunately be hit in the flank by Wofford's Georgia regiments and will about face and march away while taking fire from the enemy. A quote will be said of these men that they taught the volunteers how to fight like soldiers, and at Gettysburg, they taught them how to die like soldiers. So the only remaining troops in this part of the field will be the Pennsylvania Reserves, commanded by Samuel Crawford. Now Crawford will lead his men into a spoiling charge, Crawford himself grabbing a stand of colors to rally his men. This would finally blunt the rebel advance. In fact, by the time Crawford's attack wraps up, it's almost 8 p.m., and fighting was dying down in this sector. Though we feel it is about thrusts and counter thrusts by both sides, and is an interesting part of the battle. It seems criminal that I gave such a short account of the wheat field because it's one of my favorite spots at Gettysburg. But as I said, I hope to, in the future episodes, maybe take a more in-depth look at some of these places and tell their story better. We need to shift to William Barksdale and his charge at the Peach Orchard. Famously, Barksdale is going to be eager to get into the fray. Upon pressuring Longstreet, Old Pete will tell him, essentially, relax, they're all going to go in presently. His Mississippi regiments would launch themselves at the Peach Orchard, originally ordered not to place their percussion caps on their weapons. They would meet the regiments of Graham's Brigade. Now part of the problem was that the regiments had been mixed up in the shuffling, so there was no cohesion amongst the units. Cohesion would be important on Civil War battlefields. The 68th Pennsylvania would be hit particularly hard and withdraw. The 105th Pennsylvania Wildcats would attempt to rally. The 114th Pennsylvania calls his wobs, would suffer heavy casualties as they attempted to make several stands against the oncoming great troops. Their commander, Cuban-born Federico Cavada, would be wounded and captured. The 141st Pennsylvania would be roughly handled, facing off against the 21st Mississippi. The 73rd New York of the Excelsior Brigade would also be cut up in support, this unit being known as the 2nd Fireswaves. Under the tremendous pressure, Graham's brigade would collapse. Next, it would be Humphrey's turn to take a stand. The Excelsior Brigade would attempt to stop the momentum, but they too will break. Crucially, though, Barksdale does not want to regroup his now disorganized forces as they advance. Now, the artillery would have to try to buy time for the Union Army, which is in real crisis. Freeman McGilvery would do great work in trying to stem the enemy advance using the reserve artillery but the situation around the Trossel Farm would prove dire. He would turn to the 9th Massachusetts Light Artillery under Captain John Bigelow. This unit would be the forlorn hope of the sector. His pieces would fire by prolong, or essentially retreat by recoil. They would stack as much canister as they could to greet the Mississippi men as they continued their attack. We have an account of Bigelow describing the actions of his bugler, Charles Reed, who will be awarded the Medal of Honor. When the angle of the stone wall at the Trossel House was reached, Colonel McGilvery ordered me to halt and hold the enemy in check, sacrificing my battery if necessary, until he could get some guns in position in my rear, as lines were open from the foot of Little Round Top to the left of the Second Corps. I did so, saving twenty precious minutes for McGilvery to accomplish his purpose before my officers, men, and horses were shot down by the enemy coming in on my flanks, not one in my front. Bugler Reed sat by me on his horse, a conspicuous mark during the trying ordeal. By throwing his horse on his haunches, he saved himself from a volley fire at me by six of Kershaw's skirmishers, two of whose bullets struck me, two my horse, and two flew wild. He followed me, as my horse turned and when, after going a hundred feet, I fell to the ground, he remained with me. Heard the officers of the 21st Mississippi order their men not to fire at me, call my orderly, and had him lift me on his horse. Then taking the reins of both horses in his left hand, with his right hand supporting me in the saddle, took me at a walk into the front of the 6th main battery, which Colonel McGivery had placed in position from 300 to 500 yards in my rear while it was firing heavily and the shells of the enemy were breaking all around us. Before I was halfway back to the 6th main battery, Lieutenant Dow, commanding, sent an officer to me, urging me to hurry as he must commence firing on the men, 21st Mississippi, who had my battery. I told him to fire away. I could not hurry, so Dow opened with shell while we were in his front and with cancer after we had entered. Bugler Reed did not flinch, but steadily supported me, kept the horses at a walk, although between the two fires, and guided them, so that we entered the battery between two of the guns that were firing, heavily, 
took me to the hospital afterwards to my own camp. While I had many officers and men worthy of any honor which the government can bestow upon them for their gallantry on that other battlefields, I present the name of Charles W. Reed. During the collapse of this line, Dan Sickles is going to be wounded by an artillery round. His leg is going to be hanging off and require amputation. Reportedly, Sickles will be puffing a cigar as he is stretchered from the field. Hancock is going to employ George Willard's brigade of Hayes' division of his own 2nd Corps to pause the enemy. Willard and his New Yorkers had their record stained by their surrender at Harper's Ferry. They would zealously attempt to wipe the name Harper's Ferry Cowards from that record. They would stop Barksdale along with the support from Thomas Ruger's brigade of the 12th Corps arriving from their position around Culp's Hill. Pushing the enemy back, they would be dissuaded from continuing due to artillery that the Confederates had moved up to the Peach Orchard. Willard will have his shoulder and part of his jaw taken away by one of those shots as he about faced his regiments. In total, Willard's New Yorkers, which included the 39th New York, also known as the Garibaldi Guard, would suffer 47% casualties. Barksdale would be mortally wounded and left on the field to be captured by Union troops, where he would die at a nearby field hospital. His Mississippi Brigade had suffered 884 casualties out of their total of 1,600. Supporting Barksdale would be Dick Anderson's division of Hill's Corps. Cadmus Wilcox, along with Perry's small brigade of Floridians, would move across from their positions on Seminary Ridge and hit the Union line in the flank. Barksdale was achieving what Lee had originally designed. He was rolling up the Federal line up towards Cemetery Hill. This added to the lack of a stand by some of the Yankees in this sector. Hancock needed to buy time to cobble together more of a defense. He would turn to the 1st Minnesota, who had only 230 men. Barking to their commander, he would order the small unit to seize the enemy colors. Bravely, the 1st would charge Wilcox, probably the most famous of the many spoiling charges of the day. They would suffer 35 killed and 180 wounded as a result. We do have an account of their charge. Hancock spurred to where we stood, calling out as he reached us, What regiment is this? First Minnesota, replied Colville. Charge those lines, commanded Hancock. Every man realized in an instance what that order meant. Death or wounds to all of us. The sacrifice of the regiment to gain a few minutes' time and save the position and probably the battlefield. Every man saw and accepted the necessity for the sacrifice. And responding to Colville's rapid orders, the regiment, in perfect line, with arms at right shoulder shift, was in a moment sweeping down the slope directly upon the enemy's center. No hesitation no stopping to fire, though the men fell fast at every stride before the concentrated fire of the whole Confederate force directed upon us, as soon as the movement was observed. Silently, without orders, and almost from the start, Double Quick had changed to utmost speed, and for in utmost speed lay the only hope that any of us would pass through the storm of lead and strike the enemy. Charge, shouted Colville, as we neared their first line, and with leveled bayonets at full speed we rushed upon it. Fortunately, it was a slightly disordered in crossing a dry brook at the foot of a slope. The men were never made who will stand against leveled bayonets coming with such momentum and evident desperation. The first line broke in our front as we reached in and rushed back through the second line, stopping the whole advance. We then poured in our first fire and availing ourselves of such shelter as the low banks of the dry brook afforded, held the entire force at bay for a considerable time and until our reserves appeared on the ridge we had left. Had the enemy rallied quickly to a counter charge, its great numbers would have crushed us in a moment, and we would have made but a slight pause in its advance. But the ferocity of our onset seemed to paralyze them for the time, and although they poured upon us a terrible and continuous fire from the front and enveloping flanks, they kept at respectful distance from our bayonets until, after the added fire of our fresh reserves, they began to retire, and we were ordered back. Reformed brigades and Hayes' supporting division of the 2nd Corps would stop Wilcox and David Lang commanding the Florida regiments. Rand's Wright's Georgians would also jump off and attack the federal position along Cemetery Ridge. His men advanced toward the Kadori farm, and actually, it may surprise you to know, would see some success around where Pickett's men would charge on the third day. Wright's men would meet part of Gibbon's 2nd Corps, brushing past skirmishers from the 82nd New York and 15th Massachusetts. This brigade may have achieved a breakthrough if they had been properly supported. All this time, Richard Anderson had not moved to the front amazingly. 
Billy Mahone and his brigade do not advance for inexplicable reasons. Apparently, he would state he had been ordered by Anderson not to move forward. Carnot Posey and his brigade will advance about halfway to the ridge, but pause. Anderson could have been more active in the attack, but so too could have been A.P. Hill, who was apparently distant from the fighting, distraught that an artillery shell had wounded Dorsey Pender, which would prove mortal. This is going to be unfortunate foreshadowing for the rebels. It is interesting that the terrain and tall grass reportedly masked the rebel advance across the fields, so we can point this as an example of the ground not being flat like most people argue about Pickett's charge. Crucially though, there is also an account from a Georgian talking about how sturdy the fences were around the Emmitsburg Road, which is going to hinder the assault the following day. George Stannard, whose Vermont Brigade was made up of regiments who had been garrisoning the capital, as well as Webb's Philadelphia Brigade and that of Hall, would hold the line and repulse Wright's attack. The grand assault in the southern part of the field would peter out. The Union Army had scrambled and held. The Confederates had seen some missed opportunity. There is an interesting argument probably made by Dan Sickles that his moving of his corps does in fact save the Union Army. This is an interesting thought, one I will let you ponder. But we're not done with the second day. Remember that Yule is going to demonstrate in his part of the line and actually see some success here as well. His demonstration turned attack though is going to be delayed. In the meantime, we have a battery under Joseph Latimer deploying on Benner's Hill, which unfortunately for him is not going to be the best place for artillery. Union guns on Cemetery Hill will silence his, mortally wounding Latimer in the process. We have an account of a staff officer going over the ground after the bombardment. Never before or after did I see 15 or 20 guns in such a condition of wreck and destruction as this battalion was. It had been hurled backward, as it were, by the very weight and impact of metal from the position it had occupied on the crest of a little ridge into a saucer-shaped depression behind it, and such a scene as it presented, guns dismounted and disabled, carriages splintered and crushed, ammunition chests exploded, limbers upset, wounded horses plunging and kicking, dashing out of the brains of men tangled in the harness, while cannoneers with pistols were crawling around through the wreck, shooting the struggling horses to save the lives of the wounded men. Now, as a demonstration of what Yule does in the northern part of the battlefield fails, there's going to be an opportunity to take advantage of the Union trying to move troops around. We mentioned that the 12th Corps is going to send men to Cemetery Ridge. Culp's Hill is essentially going to be stripped of its defenders, save one brigade under George Sears Green. Yule is going to send Jubal Early against Cemetery Hill. This assault is going to be conducted by Harry Hayes and his Louisiana Tigers, as well as Isaac Avery and his North Carolina regiments. Their attack will come under fire from the 11th Corps troops that are still dug in on Cemetery Hill. Additionally, there will be artillery not only on the hill itself, but artillery on Stevens Hill nearby. The 5th Maine would be under the eye of Meade as they did hot work on the hill. Artillery had spent the day pre-siding the ground, making it deadly for the rebels if they ever jumped off, which they would do at sunset. Avery would be mortally wounded during the attack, shot in the neck, He'll put a note to his father, wishing for him to know he died with his face to the enemy. It's always amazing for me to think about these men as people, and caring less about his own life, but rather he'd want his father to know that he died in a brave fashion, uh, which obviously shows you what the mindset of a lot of these guys was. We do have an account of the assault here. After lying all day under a July sun, suffering with intense heat, and continually annoyed by the enemy sharpshooters from the heights, from sheer desperation, we hailed with delight the order again to meet the veteran foe, regardless of his advantage in numbers and position. Really, the enemy's artillery opening at the going down of the sun felt like music upon our ears. At the time of the assault was made, the enemy had massed heavily in our front and placed batteries in the rear of his own lines, which were used with fearful effect against us, firing over the heads of his own men. The ground we had to pass over was ascending, but the troops advanced in double-quick time, and with a cheer went over the rifle pits in advance of the enemy's main line of works, killing and capturing a few of them, the greater part taking refuge behind the main line of breastworks. Here the fighting was desperate, but like an unbroken wave, our maddened column rushed on, facing a continual stream of fire. After charging almost to the enemy's line, we were compelled to fall back, but only a short distance. The column reformed and charged again, but failed to dislodge the enemy. The brigade held its ground with unyielding determination, ever keeping afloat our flag to battle and breeze. 
four out of five of the color bearers who dared hold up that flag went down to a heroic death. As often as the flag went down, it was taken up and flaunted in the face of the enemy, holding an impregnable position. The hour was one of horror, amid the incessant roar of cannon, the din of musketry, and the glare of bursting shells making the darkness intermittent, adding awfulness to the scene, the hoarse shouts of friend and foe, the piteous cries of wounded and dying. One could well imagine, if it were proper to say it, that war is hell. Further effort being useless, we were ordered to fall back a short distance under cover. To remain was certain capture, to retreat was almost certain death. Few except the wounded and dead were left behind. Here these brave North Carolinians stood few and faint but fearless still. The enemy did not follow or show any disposition to leave their defenses. Hayes will have great success in driving the Union troops. In fact, he will drive not only one Union line but two. We have a description of this attack in Hayes's report. A little before 8 p.m., I was ordered to advance with my own and Hoax's brigade on my left, which had been placed for a time under my command. I immediately moved forward and had gone but a short distance when the whole of my line became exposed to a most terrific fire from the enemy's batteries, from the entire range of hills in front and to the right and left. Still, both brigades advanced steadily and over the first hill and into the bottom at the foot of Cemetery Hill. Here we came upon a considerable body of the enemy and a brisk musketry fire ensued. At the same time, his artillery of which we were now within canister range, open upon us, but owing to the darkness of the evening, now verging into the night, and the deep obscurity afforded by the smoke of the firing, our exact locality could not be discovered by the enemy's gunners, and we thus escaped, what in full light of day could have been nothing else but horrible slaughter. Taking advantage of this, we continued to move forward until we reached the second line, behind a stone wall at the foot of a fortified hill. We passed such of the enemy who had not fled, and who still cling for shelter to the wall to the rear as prisoners. Still advancing, we came upon an abatee of fallen timber and the third line, disposed of rifle pits. This line we broke, and as before, found many of the enemy who had not fled hiding in the pits for protection. These I ordered to the rear as prisoners, and continued my progress to the crest of the hill. Lines on Cemetery Hill were a little thinner, held by depleted ranks, but the Union troops would hang on. The 11th Corps troops would fight for the guns which the Tigers sought to capture. The artillerymen would use their tools as well as rocks to fight off the rebels, in some places firing directly into their assailants by cutting fuses short. Vydrick's battery contained many German-speaking men. When one Confederate placed his hand on the gun, saying that it was theirs, he replied in German, Du sollst sie haben, which translate, you shall have it, before pulling the lanyard and killing the unlucky attacker. Samuel Sprague Carroll and his brigade from Alexander Hayes' 2nd Corps Division would arrive to drive off the Confederates. Now, there are errors in the assault here as well. Early did not commit Gordon's brigade to this part of the fighting. Likewise, Rhodes was supposed to assault the hill. Doles and Ramsur were under the impression that they would be attacking a strong position in the fading light, and so Hayes' attack would go unsupported. Rhodes would also have to pull all of his men out of the town, which would take time. Remember, we talked about some of that house to house fighting, and so they were probably pretty well scattered. In fact, many of the rebels were using the town of Gettysburg to set up sniping positions. Extra Billy Smith was not thrown into the conflict either, which could be part of the problem. Even though Stuart's command would start to arrive, Smith's brigade would not be relieved from their watch of the Phantom Yankees he had seen the day before, which probably were just fence posts. Ewell would leave the decision-making to his field commanders, which is adding to his poor performance and lack of decision-making. Much of the same theme as the action in the South, the Confederates are going to have ample opportunity that will go for naught. Cemetery Hill could be used to repulse Pickett's charge the next day, but we're going to get there. There is still one final attack that we need to talk about on the 2nd. As mentioned, George Sears Green is alone with his New York Brigade on Culp's Hill. He's going to dig in and importantly will have a traverse line of defense in case he gets flanked. Green was an engineer, so this is going to make sense. He will be facing the entire division of Allegheny Johnson. Johnson will be without the Stonewall Brigade, crucially. This unit will be skirmishing with the Union Cavalry on Brinkerhoff's Ridge, a little to the east, which is important to the action on the night of the 2nd, because if there had been one more brigade to throw in, he might have been able to take the hill. It would be a difficult task for Maryland Stewart's Brigade of Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina troops, as well as Jesse Williams and his Louisiana men as well as Rum Jones with his several Virginia regiments. 
The men of Williams's command would be fairly diverse, as would other Louisiana regiments at Gettysburg, containing some Hispanic troops amongst other ethnicities. But they would have to go through open ground, cross Rock Creek, which is actually fairly deep at the time of the battle, and then up a hill. It's a pretty tough task. Some of the Confederates were right that they needed scaling the ladders just to get up. Not only were the New Yorkers well-placed, but they were also concealed from the attackers. They would hold their fire until the enemy drew fairly close. We actually have a description of the action. Our regiment and the 149th were posted to guard the line of entrenchments thrown up by Kane's brigade, thus scattering our small force over a distance four times greater than that originally occupied by us. Just as this disposition of our troops was made, firing on our front announced the advance of the rebels. The pickets made a gallant stand and then fell back to the trenches. The approach of the enemy was met by a rapid and deliberate fire from our men, who stoutly maintained their position until it became so dark that we could no longer discover the movements of the enemy. Then, taking advantage of our want of support on the right, a body of rebels succeeded in turning our right flank and gained a position behind a stone wall directly in our rear, not more than a hundred yards distant. A murderous fire was opened upon us, and our regiment was ordered to fall back to the left. Owing to the darkness and the nature of the ground, considerable confusion ensued in executing this movement, but as soon as beyond the reach of the fire in their rear, the men rallied, charged back with a cheer, drove out the rebels, and resumed their position in the trenches, which they held until relieved by General Kane's brigade. Now specifically, this is actually an account of the 137th New York, who's going to charge the enemy, a la Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine, and this unit's commanded by David Ireland. So even on this part of the field, there's a Chamberlain-like bayonet charge in a desperate situation uh, that gets the Union Army out of a jam. And you can kind of compare the two because is Culp's Hill really, is it even as tactically great a position as Little Round Top? Well, that's debatable as well, as it's not like you can use artillery on that platform because it's heavily wooded, but certainly it would have threatened the Union supply lines, and that could have been a major problem for Meade. The 14th Brooklyn and the 6th Wisconsin will show up in support, as well as a regiment from Schindelfenden's Brigade. The 71st Pennsylvania from Webb's Philadelphia Brigade would show up too, but in the confusion they would turn around. The rebels would see some success and push the enemy back in several places, but they would not be able to capitalize. The Stonewall Brigade maybe could have been more weight to the assault, or they could have also flanked the position. As it was, the lower portion of Culp's Hill would be in rebel hands as the second day wound down. And speaking of winding down, there we go. We have finally reached the end here of the second day. So part two of this week's episodes about Gettysburg. And this was quite a monster of an episode. We also had part one as being a very monster episode as well. And we're going to come back next week with an additional monster episode. And that's going to close out Gettysburg day three we're going to talk about that next week. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be links to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>